This month on Focus Black Oklahoma, we discuss the Oklahoma County District Attorney's decision to drop charges against seven police officers involved in the killings of three men. Review allegations of corruption against the Oklahoma Department of Human Services. Learn about a Louisiana community's battle for environmental justice against an Oklahoma natural gas corporation. Explore the legacy of Clara Looper and her contribution to the civil rights movement in Oklahoma. Discuss how HBCUs have become the safe haven for black women to achieve their dreams and not fall into the stereotypes against them. Discover the World Stage Theater Company through its upcoming production, The Chinese Lady. All of this and more on Focus Black Oklahoma. Focus Black Oklahoma is sponsored by the Black Church Traditions and African American Faith Life Program at Phillips Seminary, offering a master's degree in social justice online and in person. Learn more at wherefaithleads.com. A 2021 study published by the Lancet Medical Journal revealed Oklahoma has the highest mortality rates from police violence in the United States, with Tulsa and Oklahoma City in the top 20 cities with the most fatal police shootings. Against this backdrop, the newly elected district attorney for Oklahoma County has stirred controversy with her decision to drop charges against seven officers involved in the killings of three different men. Here's Shonda Little with details. On July 29th, longtime criminal justice reform advocate and current public servant Sarah Banna wrote a scathing rebuke of recently elected Oklahoma County District Attorney Vicki Pahina's decision the day prior to drop charges against seven different Oklahoma City police officers in the killings of three different men. Previous District Attorney David Prater had filed charges against all seven men in 2020. In fact, One officer, Chance Avery, had already completed his preliminary evidence hearing before a sitting judge who agreed that the prosecution had enough evidence to move forward. The three human beings who Prater and community activists believe were killed unjustly at the hands of police were Stavion Rodriguez, Christopher Poor, and Benny Edwards. The seven officers charged in the three cases were Officer Chance Avery, in the case of first-degree manslaughter and second-degree murder of 49-year-old Christopher Poor, Officers Corey Adams, Jared Burton, Bradley Pemberton, Bethany Sears, and John Sakuda, in the case of first-degree manslaughter of 15-year-old Stavian Rodriguez, and Officer Clifford Holman, in the first-degree manslaughter case of 60-year-old Benny Edwards. In Banna's skating social media post, she wrote, quote, Yesterday, We witnessed absolute and total miscarriage of justice delivered by our new county DA. What we witnessed was a DA willing to play politics and negotiate on human life and civil rights with the fraternal order of police. Our new DA reinforced total and absolute qualified immunity for killer cops, including Chance Avery, who is now responsible for two murders while in uniform and a series of sexual assaults. Our new DA, through her political decision-making process, reversed 21st century standards for police accountability. Our new DA escalated the serious existing dangers for Oklahomans with mental illness who encounter OCPD's killer cops and inhumane culture. Our new DA was intellectually dishonest and attempted to deflect responsibility for her egregious decisions by pointing to an outside third-party consultant. Our new DA opted to focus on portions of specific laws while neglecting to interpret and enforce all existing laws regarding this matter. There was a team of lawyers in this office, seven lawyers that were gathered. Um, that we spent hundreds of hours reviewing the case file in each of these cases, and we reviewed it independently. So we- Bahina added that, quote, under Oklahoma law, these shootings were justified end quote. She also added, quote, this is not just a quick spur of the moment decision. This was very difficult, very fact intensive decision and review, end quote. A statement sent by Banna pointed to D.A. Brahena's use of an out-of-state use of force expert, a fact that Bahena has freely acknowledged and also cited as justification for dropping these charges as, quote, unprecedented. Oklahoma does not require a use of force expert to file charges. OCPD officers Daniel Holtzclaw and Keith Sweeney 
were successfully prosecuted in Oklahoma County without a prosecution use of force expert. Officer Randy Harrison of Dell City was as well successfully prosecuted without a use of force expert, all in Oklahoma County, end quote. In what will be a series on this development and other cases in these officers' past, today we will have a theme of mothers and sons. We start with a different mother, Melissa Goodblanket of Custer County, Oklahoma. Her son, Mahavis, he had been raised with and by his people until December 14, 2014, when a call for mental health services resulted in young Mahavitz having former Custer County Sheriff's Deputy Chance Avery enter his home. I am the mother of Mahavitz Goodblanket, who was shot and killed on December 21, 2013, Custer County, Oklahoma, by numerous uh, badge-wearing individuals. One named in such case was Chance Avery. Mahavitz was 18 years old when his earthly life was ended that day. The Good Blanket family, as well as many in the Cheyenne and Arapahoe community and social justice communities, have sought answers. On that evening, when officers arrived, Chance Avery was the second on scene. He teamed up with the first officer. And the end result was the shooting death of our son. He was shot seven times, once to the back of his head. There were nine shots fired inside my home in my kitchen. And the end result was the death of our son. Uh, the district of DA at that time was out of county and um, put an assistant DA in charge of the case. The Bureau in Oklahoma City, OSBI, was the investigative party in the case. We have yet to receive any type of justice or even an apology for what happened here, what took place here. Avery then later found his way to the Village Police Department in Oklahoma City, where his path crossed into another Native family's, that of 49-year-old Christopher Poor. Fanna believes it's another case of Avery targeting Native and Indigenous families. During my visits to Custer County and Clinton, uh, during that time, I believe some of the women who had had encounters with um, Chance Avery had found out there is an activist, a advocate in here in their local community looking into this shooting. I began receiving calls from multitudes of Native American women um, who were reporting that Chance Avery had targeted them um, and had sexually assaulted them all the way up to allegations of sodomy. Banna continued to list complaints she heard from Native and Indigenous women related to Officer Avery. Melissa Goodblanket says what happened to her son is repeated history. My boys are direct, direct descendants of Black Kettle on the Cheyenne side. And on the um, Arapahoe side, they're direct descendants of Little Raven. And whether there are people um, out there who believe this or not, uh, I can say that Our son, Ma'avitz, had distinct memories of a most recent past life. There was a young warrior who was killed at at Ouachita. His name was Ma'avitz. He, too, was shot in the back of the head while trying to save his people from what was happening. He, too, was 18 years old when he um, crossed over. There are a lot of synchronistic things. In next month's FBO, hear more from Banna, the victims' families, from the cases that Bahina dismissed, activists, and a former Oklahoma City police chief who advocates for 21st century policing. For Focus, Black Oklahoma, this is Shonda Little in Cheyenne. The Department of Human Services, or DHS, is a light of hope for many people and a lifeline for vulnerable children and families in need. But what happens if that trust is shattered? Families have been devastated as a result of allegations of corruption and malpractice, and our communities are seeking answers. Here's Don Carter with more. For many, the Department of Human Services, or DHS, is a beacon of hope, a lifeline for vulnerable children and families in need. But what happens when that trust is shaken? Reports of alleged corruption and malpractice have left families shattered and our communities demanding answers. In January of 2023, I was arrested at a domestic violence shelter in Arkansas where I was protecting my children. And it's an event that I do feel it's an injustice. A lot of people feel that it's an injustice. 
I had a protective order for myself and my children. And I still have that protective order to this day for myself and my children protecting us against the father. And um, DHS got involved in our case. That was Rosario Chico, a local television producer known for her work in TV programs like My 600 Pound Live, In Pursuit with John Walsh, and The First 48. Her struggle with the Department of Human Services and the battle for custody of her children coincided with her relocation to Tulsa, Oklahoma, for her work on the first 48. They recommended that I file for emergency custody. I couldn't do that at the time because my attorney was sick. So to best comply with DHS, I filed a protective order. And I had also filed a notice of suspension of visitation. And whenever opposing counsel and the father found out uh, of DHS involvement, they filed for emergency custody. And so I rushed to the courthouse. I was uh, in jeans, a T-shirt, no makeup, not what I typically show up to court in uh, to try to prevent this from happening. Right. Dad be granted emergency because historically the courts had also failed us. And so I showed up. uh, The father was served the protective order, but his counsel and him proceeded to file for emergency custody and in the alternative for paternal grandmother to have custody of the children. The judge, the family court judge, um, she denied dad's emergency and denied for our children to go to paternal grandmother. And so she left the children with me. She acknowledged the protective order. The protective order was in place then, still in place now. And um, and I left the state of Oklahoma with my children because I was scared that for the first time he may be held accountable. And I didn't know what could happen. I didn't know what he could do. Um We had a history of domestic violence where he was the perpetrator, Um, a history of, you know, threats by him, suicide, him cutting himself with knives and him uh, having that history in in previous relationships. And so I was scared and I just didn't know what was going to happen. Rosario is presently confronting charges of felony child stealing resulting from her departure from the state with the intention of safeguarding her children an action mandated by law for which she can be legally held accountable if she fails to fulfill this duty. As outlined by OKDHS policy, definitions, and substantiation protocols, this offense is referred to as failure to protect. This term encompasses the failure to undertake reasonable measures to rectify or prevent instances of child abuse or neglect. It also encompasses the behavior of a non-abusive parent or guardian who possesses knowledge of the abuser or the individual neglecting the child, but engages in falsehoods, concealment, or the omission of reporting the child abuse or neglect, or neglects to take appropriate steps to bring an end to the abuse or neglect. In family court, there's a statute that um, you can be charged with interference of custody. But there's an affirmative defense that if you are protecting your children and there's a safety concern, and if you contacted local law enforcement, you can't be criminally charged because you're protecting your children. But that statute exists within family court that there's still question whether it exists within the guardianship court. So the guardianship is a loophole. They found, they criminally charged me with child stealing. Um, I do personally feel, others feel that it's a loophole charge because I took all the measures to protect my children. I didn't just run off and didn't tell anybody. I filed a notice of suspension of visitation. I filed for a protective order and it was granted after DHS told me to file for emergency custody and to protect. I left the state of Oklahoma. There was no pending court order in custody court, in family court for me to not be able to leave the state or to ask for permission from anybody to not leave the state. I contacted local law enforcement. I contacted DHS. I contacted Homeland Security. My legal team contacted the FBI. My legal team contacted the DA, contacted the U.S. attorney who gave advice to go to 
the Mexican consulate for help, which was in Little Rock, Arkansas. I was found about 30 minutes from Little Rock, Arkansas. And so I took the proper measures. I was trying to get help. And I had been failed by the Tulsa court system. Subsequently, the paternal grandmother of Rosario's children pursued emergency guardianship, a request that was approved despite the ongoing presence of a restraining order against the children's father, which significantly contributes to her distress. Presently, her interaction with her children is confined to supervised visitations taking place every Sunday with a fee of $40 per hour. Dana Brockway, serving as the executive director of Dear John and as a member of the Oklahoma City NAACP Legal Redress Committee, possesses direct experience observing the aftermath of the mishandling of Oklahoma families by the courts and OKDHS systems. And we started seeing a pattern of injustice through DHS. Um, it seemed like the agency that was supposed to help protect and serve those to, to reconcile them back with families or help families um, have a better quality of life within their familyhood was actually ripping them apart. And it almost seemed um, like they were putting kids up for sale. And we we advocated strongly. We, we held picket signs. We walked the corners. We went to the to the courthouses. And what we found, which was sad on, on many levels, was we, we knew that it wasn't just Oklahoma. We knew it was on a national level. But we also knew that Oklahoma would stifen. They would pretty much stop the advocacy voice of it. Media uh, covered it to a certain degree. Um, the courts, it was so one-sided for families that were encountering it. Um, if you walked into the courtrooms, you had everybody on the state side and just unfortunately the people that they were filing against and they were by themselves. If they did not have the money for an attorney and, you know, sadly enough, the attorneys may not have been working for them. In 2019, Brockway joined a group of whistleblowers and families prepared to file a lawsuit highlighting claims of DHS's inadequate care for children. Partnering with attorney Rachel Bussett, they were representing over two dozen Oklahoma families and caseworkers in alleging agency corruption, citing unnecessary pain and harm inflicted on families. In the end, Quay states that the reconciliation of the children and their represented families led to the lawsuit against DHS not being filed. In our communities, they don't have enough knowledge to fight back. And you know, we can go to California and Georgia and, and wherever else, and we can see strong advocacies. When George Floyd happened, strong advocacies. You come here, yes, you may get a couple of people that may stand out and petition and picket, but there's no follow through. We don't have a lot of representation in the courtrooms and the courtrooms, you know, we are actually the defendants more so than the plaintiff. When we battle DHS, it is... If you come in as an advocate for that family, we don't get to come in and be heard. But yet they'll have CASA on the advocate for the state and CASA may not tell the truth. So what you're, what you're essentially saying is, no, now you're going to be stuck because we've already stacked the cards against you. The judge is for the state. CASA is for the state. The district attorney is for the state. Everybody is for the state. Well, who's for the people? In 2023, Oklahoma's overall child well-being ranking stands at 46th nationally, as reported by the Oklahoma Policy Institute. This marks a decline from the state's 45th ranking in 2020. For Rosario, who faces a court date on September 18th, this statistic exemplifies the system's failure and its repercussions. Unfortunately, we, we have many cases of parents that try to protect that aren't finding help within the court system or within DHS or within law enforcement system. For Focus, Black Oklahoma, I'm Don Carter in Oak Mulgee. You're listening to Focus, Black Oklahoma. In the midst of the world's urgent call for clean energy, a new project in Plaquemines Parish, Louisiana, casts a contentious light on the fine line between economic progress and environmental destruction. 
At the center of this new project is the proposed liquid natural gas export facility, which is projected to provide prosperity to some while posing environmental risks to others. Two corporate titans with ties to the George Kaiser Family Foundation are behind the idea. Here's Nick Alexandrov with his second installment of this series. It's billed as clean energy, a transition fuel to a livable future. I'm talking about natural gas in its liquefied form or LNG. But a new LNG export facility in Plaquemines Parish, Louisiana, a site where Tulsa billionaire George Kaiser plans to profit, will usher in a different world one that's uninhabitable. A recap. The firm building the Plaquemines LNG terminal is called Venture Global. It's based in Virginia. George Kaiser's company, which ships LNG throughout the world, is called Accelerate Energy. It's based near Houston. The two companies, neither of which responded to interview requests, signed a sales and purchase agreement last February. Under its terms, Venture Global will supply 700,000 tons of LNG each year to accelerate. The deal is in effect for 20 years. Building and profiting from this project, deemed the most expensive plant ever built in this part of the world, is the exact opposite of what climate scientists and energy economists advise. Groups like the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change and the International Energy Agency routinely release statements that are unambiguous. To avert climate disaster, we must halt fossil fuel development. Accelerate is little discussed in Oklahoma, where the conversation, if Kaiser is the focus, surrounds organizations like the George Kaiser Family Foundation, considered a pillar in this community of Tulsa, as co-host Kent Myers told viewers of The Verdict in 2011. He interviewed Ken Levitt, the foundation's executive director, that year. What is the mission of the George Kaiser Family Foundation? The mission is we're most focused on intervening as early as possible in the cycle of poverty to help the next generation have an equal shot at the American dream. But documents filed with the U.S. Securities and Exchange Commission reveal a broader mission, one that links the foundation to Kaiser's business ventures. The foundation, for example, first owned the vessels Accelerate uses to ship LNG. Accelerate leased them from the foundation for decades, then bought them outright last year. Untangling the relationship between Kaiser's philanthropic and natural gas interests is difficult. The George Kaiser Family Foundation, which supports Focus Black Oklahoma, responded to an interview request by directing me to Accelerate Energy. Accelerate did not respond in time for this broadcast. And two experts in nonprofit economics admitted, when I contacted them, that they were not sure why the charity had owned LNG assets. But whatever the connections between Kaiser's giving and profit seeking, the impacts of LNG development in the Gulf are easier to comprehend. So here you see the particulate matter, the SO2, the nitrogen oxide, and the carbon monoxide, and then the volatiles. Those are the ones that are the most toxic known human cancer-causing agents. That's Wilma Subra. She's working through a table listing the Plaquemines LNG site's permitted emissions, the pollutants it will send into the atmosphere. This is what I do seven days a week, 20 hours a day. She's been at it for decades. I have Subra Company, which I founded in 1981 to provide technical assistance to community groups dealing with environmental and human health issues. Wilma helped me understand the human costs of Venture Global's terminal in southeastern Louisiana. It's near black and indigenous towns like West Point, Alahash, and Ironton, places that are consistently dis- damaged or destroyed by hurricanes. We heard from one of Ironton's lifelong residents, Melissa Washington, last month. I grew up there. My family's from there and everything. Going through with the hurricane and stuff like that, we've been displaced since 2021 since I had a hit. Just beyond Highway 23 within Plaquemines Parish lies the small town of Ironton, completely crippled by Hurricane Ida. Melissa's ruined Ironton home is six miles from the site where Kaiser's Accelerate Energy will profit. As that site prepares liquefied natural gas for export, it will, every year, release hundreds of tons of particulate matter and other pollutants into the air. These substances raise the risks of heart disease, lung cancer, and asthma attacks, to name just a few potential effects. 
for Wilma Subra, the toll of these pollutants on area residents is clear. This is what they're going to be inhaling every day, every night for the rest of their lives and the rest of their families' lives. And then there's the climate question. Hello, my name is Jesse Parfait, and I am a registered member of the United Homa Nation, the tribe who is called the lands of South Louisiana home for ever. But South Louisiana, because of climate change, is vanishing. This is a statewide story. Compare a map of Louisiana in the 1930s to the same map today, it's like a chunk the size of Delaware is missing. That's the extent of the land loss. The problem is even more severe along the Gulf. Plaquemines Parish is roughly half the size it was a century ago, and it faces extensive wetland loss in the coming decades. Liquefied natural gas plants accelerate this loss. Venture Global's terminal, according to an oil and gas watch report, will impact over 450 acres of wetlands. Its construction in this respect jeopardizes groups that suffer the most from major storms. Wetlands are our best defense against storm surge. They kind of act like a little speed bump for storms coming in off the Gulf that kind of slow things down before they're able to get into our communities. And the more we lose of that, the less protection we have. This protection has disappeared over the course of Jesse's life. Growing up on the coast, you're aware of land loss. You can see the dead cypress trees from saltwater intrusion. You can see the dead oak trees, the gray ghosts, as we like to call them. You can see all of those things, but like you don't actually see and hear elders talk about where the land actually was. So, you know, you'll see a marker, like a platform or whatever, and they'll be like, yeah, you used to be able to walk here. And now you can't. Witnessing water overtake ancestral lands, this fate awaits other communities of color along the Gulf. These communities are at the spear point of climate change. Their future is linked to Venture Global and Accelerate Energy's profits. I'll have my final installment in this series next month, when I'll explore the social and political challenges confronting people of color in southeastern Louisiana. For Focus, Black Oklahoma, I'm Nick Alexandrov in Plaquemines Parish, Louisiana. Clara Looper, a pioneering Black educator and activist whose sit-ins in the late 1950s prompted state desegregation, is at the center of Oklahoma's civil rights legacy. Educators are reviewing Looper's lectures and deeds more than half a century later, drawing parallels and lessons for today. Jasmine Bivar Toby delves into this legacy and its current relevance. On August 19, 65 years ago, 13 students from Oklahoma City and a teacher started a revolution that significantly impacted the desegregation of restaurants. Clara Looper, the daughter of Mr. and Mrs. Ezell Shepard, was born in rural Okfusky County and grew up in Hoffman. She received her B.A. from Langston and her M.A. from the University of Oklahoma. From 1958 to 1964, she led a group of NAACP Youth Council members and Oklahomans of a variety of backgrounds through sit-in demonstrations and marches to end segregation, ultimately impacting segregation throughout the state. She is the recipient of over 150 awards and citations and participated in freedom rides and marches all over the United States, including the March on Washington. During her career, she was arrested at least 26 times. Her work still informs community organizing today. July 17th through the 21st, the Clara Looper Legacy Committee and the Restorative Justice Institute of Oklahoma, RJIOK for short, partnered to lead more than 30 Oklahoma City area public school teachers through the Clara Looper Institute. Throughout the week, the Legacy Committee, led by her daughter, Marilyn Looper Hildreth, including former Clara Looper students, sit owners and community members, visited to share their experiences growing up during the movement. This program invited teachers to read Behold the Walls, Clara Looper's autobiography, and design a lesson plan to incorporate in their upcoming school year. As an additional demonstration of Looper's methodology, teachers were invited to do an art project to synthesize their experience of the Institute and Clara Looper's impact on them after studying the history, meeting the sit-inners, and learning about her relationship with students. Lead facilitators Dr. Carlos Hill of the Clara Looper Legacy Committee and Reverend Tamara Labak from RJIOK grounded participants in pedagogy and Clara's passion for teaching along with civic engagement. 
You'll hear Dr. Hill, professor at the University of Oklahoma and the Clara Looper Department of African American Studies, share on the legacy of Looper influencing our students today. When I think about the legacy of Clara Looper, it's very tangible. It's her students. It's Marilyn. It's Larry. It's Joyce. That's her legacy. The reason I'm on the Legacy Committee is to help extend her legacy. So all of the scholarship, the talks and panel conversations, it's about extending that legacy, the impact that she has on people. I have had so many of them say if Clara Looper, with all that she had against her, was able to affirm, love, support students, then with all of that we have, even though we're 48th, we still have more than she had. We're 48th in education. We still got more than Clara Looper had teaching in segregated schools. Dr. Autumn Brown, assistant professor at Oklahoma State University, facilitated a conversation titled Looper's Diamonds, a Pedagogy of Possibility, centered around eight principles used by Looper with students both in and outside of the classroom. After her presentation, she shared the top reasons why her work in oral history has been informed by Looper. I also think how she really leveraged her history classroom as this breeding ground for training up young activists. She was able to really show using the U.S. Constitution how they had a right to exist in the world as first class citizens. And if they were not going to be afforded those rights, then the U.S. Constitution also said they had a right to protest and fight for those rights and for their own freedom. I really loved how she was able to leverage her role as a history teacher to activate and organize her students. Part of her methodology that stands out is how active she was in the community. She didn't view teaching as something that was just from 8 a.m. to 3 p.m., but she showed up as a teacher in every capacity. Understanding that for Looper, it was making sure that her students had what they needed outside of the classroom, even knowing that during the sit-ins, she would have them bring books and magazines. There was learning taking place even within these sit-in demonstrations. Understanding that anywhere Looper showed up, she showed up as a teacher. While the Institute focused on the methodology and practices of Clara Looper, some participants experienced personal transformation that unlocked their own radical love and compassion, the core of Clara Looper's methodology. Alicia Priest, longtime Oklahoma educator, shares her shift in perspective. As a leader of the State Teachers Union during the tumultuous time that we are in, I grew not just tough skin. I built up a wall, a hard wall where nothing was going to get past that because I was not going to be hurt. What I have known, but what became so clear to me here was you cannot practice radical love if you do not let love in and if you are not authentically giving love. There's surface, I care about you. Then there's radical love that Looper had for her students, her diamonds. If I didn't start letting myself feel, then I could not fully commit to what needs to be done in education today. If that's what we're doing in school is paper and pencil, get on your computer, then we are not doing it right. They need us authentically present. They need us getting to know who they are so that we can make lessons that meet their needs and move them to a level of self-love. Veronica Brewer, a part of the team of teaching assistants that facilitated the Clara Looper Institute, reflects on her takeaways during the week. I was thinking about this earlier, how sometimes when we're teaching about black history, we want to go like abstract black history facts and people. And I was thinking for students who live in Oklahoma, how important it is to know that there's heroes next door and that you can be the, your own hero and that legacy can start with you and not wait for those big stars. You can be that person now. You don't have to wait on anyone. On September 1st, join Tri-City Collective for our first Friday presentation dedicated to the story of Looper's experiences in Tulsa during the sit-in movement. To explore more on the legacy of Clara Looper, visit claralooperlegacy.com. For Focus, Black Oklahoma, I'm Jasmine Bivar Toby in Oklahoma City. Would you like to pitch a story to FBO? Or work with us as a correspondent? Please email us at contact at focusblackoklahoma.com.
Between 1990 and 2020, the percentage of black women with a bachelor's degree or higher increased from 11% to 26%, but black women still face obstacles in higher education. Historically black colleges and universities, or HBCUs, like Langston University in Langston, Oklahoma, have become the safe haven for black women to achieve their dreams and not fall into the stereotypes labeled against them. Sheridan Jenkins has the story. Black women made up 9.7% of college students between 2009 and 2012, compared to Asian American women, 8.7%, white women, 7.1%, and even white men, 6.1%. However, women of color still face challenges pursuing higher education. According to Leah Waldai and Emery Will, quote, Throughout the nation, Black women of all ages face a burdensome number of challenges as they attempt to navigate the taxing world of academia. From primary school to higher education, we remain painfully cognizant of the racial discrimination, gender bias, and everyday microaggressions from our peers and teachers. This knowledge is devastating to the Black woman scholar's self-confidence. It is a weight she must carry as she seeks academic growth, end quote. A topic often overlooked are the problems that African-American women still face while working to obtain a higher education. Stereotypes that suggest Black women are loud, angry, and obnoxious descend from enslavement in the Jim Crow era. Whether at work, school, or social settings, these prejudices follow Black women with every step. These assumptions, many unwittingly internalized, silence Black women. This makes them hesitant to speak openly, which has detrimental impacts on their capacity to gain employment or pursue opportunities that match their potential or attainment. Despite the numerous factors standing against Black women, this story will focus on stereotypes that have separated African-American women from their non-Black counterparts even before they begin college. The first stereotype is being perceived as stubborn. Many non-minorities become displeased when a Black woman has a strong mind, since they won't just give in to the pressures that are put on them to fail. The second identified issue is being an angry Black woman. There are various facets of American culture where the stereotype of the angry Black woman is present, including the workplace. People and organizations frequently believe that Black women are more prone than other women and men to be combative, angry, and aggressive. The final issue is socioeconomic status. Regardless of being raised in the working or middle classes, obstacles remain that prevent Black women from achieving their full potential in terms of access to education, financial stability, and health care. In a 2008 article written by Amy Azam, published by the Association for Supervision and Curriculum Development, quote, high-achieving African-American students may be exposed to less rigorous curriculums, attend schools with fewer resources, and have teachers who expect less of them academically than they expect of similarly situated Caucasian students, end quote. Furthermore, from a 2019 survey of consumer finances posted by the Federal Reserve, quote, Black and Hispanic families have considerably less wealth than white families. Black families' median and mean wealth is less than 15% that of white families at 24100 and 142500 respectively, end quote. Black women have faced barriers for many years, ranging from systematic racism to sexism and even advancing in the workplace. Take a listen to how three African-American women share their thoughts on the barriers they have encountered while being a woman of color obtaining higher education. First, you will hear from Shanice McKnight, followed by Shalala Jones, and then Journey Donaldson. Just being a Black woman is a barrier just from trying to get a job. They don't talk about coming out of college, trying to come into that adulthood of getting a job. So I definitely think like mm, there's a lot of barriers just in general throughout life. Yes, I definitely feel like I have, like she said, being a Black woman and like the transition from like high school to college. I know for me, I graduated from a predominantly white institution. And so coming to Langston, it was honestly like culture shock, even though I'm surrounded by my people now. That was kind of like an adjustment in itself. And then, you know, you go from Langston to the world and when you get out here, you're right back, you know, as a minority again. And so I think that's kind of an obstacle in itself, just those adjustments as you transition. 
I agree. I was also came from a predominantly white institution. And so it's kind of a different space walking into a college and being like, oh, as a black woman and being like, okay, so what can I do now? And then you have to also take account what are your limitations? And you have to take into account every step you take with higher education. For some other people, that may be easier. They can just go into stuff and be like, oh, piece of cake. But it's not that simple for women, most likely um, black women too. I feel like sometimes we have to work a thousand times harder to get what we want to reach our goals. And we're going to achieve that every step we take, but we have to look at the facts, you know, but we do it pretty well. Langston University is the only historical black college or university in Oklahoma. The university is considered a mecca for community building amongst minorities. Let's see how Donaldson and Jones recount their time at Langston. Going to the only HBCU in Oklahoma, I feel like in like an intimate setting like this, we'll complain about certain things that go on, of course, because we live there and stuff happens. But on the bright side, Langston is such a tight knit community for real. And it's yeah, it's small. It's on that hill. But we have community like no other point blank period. And it's crazy because anywhere I go really in Oklahoma, I'll run into someone and they're like, oh, I know Langston. I went to Langston or yeah, my parents went or someone went to Langston and they're just doing so well for themselves and just see people that look like me come from the only HBCU in Oklahoma thriving. I cannot wait to walk across that stage and be like, I'm added to that stat like right there. Yes. Coming from a PWI like my entire life. I didn't understand the extent of the experience that I would have because, for one, I wasn't introduced to a lot of HBCUs. It just wasn't the forefront. Everyone was going to D1 PWIs. And so I followed in my godparents' footsteps and I came to Langston on a scholarship and I had no idea what was in store. But, you know, I have my friends. They're going to become my bridesmaids, my kids' godparents, you know. And so I'm excited about that. And I know that I wouldn't have gotten it anywhere else but an HBCU. So being that it's the only one in the state of Oklahoma... You know, I'm glad to be in this state, working here, employed, and to be able to say that I came from the only HBCU. Living in a world where limitations are placed against Black women, it can be hard to remain encouraged and see the light at the end of the tunnel. McKnight, Jones, and Donaldson provide some insights. I feel like, honestly, the world is changing, and I feel like as Black people, as Black women, as women in general, you should definitely feel like there are no limits to what you can do and what you think you can do. Of course, there's limits. Like, I can't lift a big old bed by myself, you know? Like, can I give me, a, you know, some help? But I definitely feel like there should be no limits to where you think is possible. Yes, the opportunities are limitless. And I think our ancestors, they, they did it for us. Mm-hmm. And the people that paved the way for us, they've made sure that we are now comfortable and we can walk into any room and steal the show. And I think that really leaning on other Black women and other Black people in general, we've created, we've done a good job of creating a community, you know, in every aspect of life in order for us to be able to depend on each other when we are struggling and we do doubt ourselves and we are tired of being discriminated against. And those are the very people that encourage you to get up and go to work that morning. And that might be the morning you have that promotion that you've always wanted. And so I think just leaning on each other and making sure that we remain the confident Black women that we always are, I think that's that's how we overcome it. I would say they always have this idea of a strong Black woman, but you also have to put in account that Black women need rest too. So just don't forget that you're allowed to rest. You're allowed to be stress-free and take a minute for yourself because this idea, we're obviously strong. We prove that every single day. But if you don't rest and reset, you're not going to get to that potential that's within you. So I feel like in order to live authentically yourself, you have to rest so you can be a better version of yourself for sure. According to Justice Watson in Urban Wire, quote, Black women are more likely than their white counterparts to work in low-paying jobs, experience higher levels of poverty, and remain disproportionately disadvantaged across a broad range of economic measures, including wealth, end quote. Black women in society must still push themselves to go above and beyond to make a point twice as hard for half as much. As specified by Payscale, quote, in 2023, For every dollar that men make, women earn 83 cents when data are uncontrolled, end quote. Following that on average, Black women in the U.S. are paid 36% less than white men and 12% less than white women. Black women have come a long way from dreamers to accomplishers, yet there are still fields in which African-American women are underrepresented. 
the Black community is still making progress, and seeing people who look like them in occupations such as geographers and accountants will inspire future generations. For Focus Black Oklahoma, I'm Sheridan Jenkins in Langston. All the world's a stage, and in Tulsa, the World Stage Theater Company is a new player on the scene. The company's upcoming production of The Chinese Lady is its latest opportunity to utilize theater as a medium to explore topics that impact society locally and globally. Anthony Cherry has the story. Americans' curiosity and China and its people is nothing new. The Chinese Lady is a theater production that taps into that curiosity in order to foster a positive interaction with Chinese culture. The play opens September 1st and runs through September 10th at World Stage Theater's Storefront Theater on 1130 South Harvard. Set against the 19th century backdrop of a rapidly changing world, the play invites audiences to step into the shoes of Afong Moi, the first documented Chinese woman in American history. Connect with the Chinese main character as she navigates the complexities of cultural identity, exploitation, and resilience. Brought to the United States in 1834 by American merchants who intended to exhibit her as a curiosity and spectacle due to her Chinese origin, Moy was essentially put on display as part of an exhibition or show to attract audiences and generate profits. Her act became so popular, President Andrew Jackson was excited to get his own ticket and to meet her in person. Jeremy Stevens, the director of The Chinese Lady, tells us more. She was born into poverty in China. And part of that issue was they had already had their quota with this particular dynasty of children. So they couldn't have this child. So in order to do what the dominating government decreed, they had to sell that child into slavery. Um, And this particular form of slavery was she was put on display in America at 14 years old on the side of a railroad box car and they'd wheel it open. People would pay their ticket price, which I think was like a penny. And back then was that's a lot of money. And they would watch her. She would tell stories of her homeland. And so she was this exotic, basic thing that they could come watch. And then they would leave and the doors would shut and they'd wheel to another city. Human curiosities as an entertainment phenomenon have been part of the American show industry since 1738. Before Afong Moy arrived in the United States, Chang and Ng Bunker, a pair of conjoined twins, had already acquired fame by exhibiting themselves as stage oddities. Afong Moy's tour began in New York, premiering in October of 1834. Moy spoke no English. Her beautiful clothes and binded feet were on display. Adults paid about $12 in today's currency to see her. Because of the fascination a few years ago with The Greatest Showman, which told a very positive story of P.T. Barnum, he was not that good of a man. This particular story is like he buys her and puts her in his circus as one of the freak show folks, performers, and she slowly realizes that all the promises of her being able to go out on her own and live in America or leave and go back to China to her family, that was all to coax her into staying and doing what they ask her to do. But in the meantime, you learn this beautiful, delicate performer and the, this, this woman and her story of denied independence. And it rings true in other underrepresented communities. And that's why I thought it was important to bring this particular story. Jeremy's proposal was written with a specific intent. This was the first time World Stage did a, an open call for uh, director statements of intent. So if you have a play, what is the name of the play and why do you want to do it? And uh, my, my full-time job is director of community engagement at the Tulsa Performing Arts Center. So I spend most of my time looking for ways to recognize and celebrate art that's being created throughout the community that is often neglected from representation. Oklahoma's diverse community of people has a multitude of rarely explored stories. The Asian American community is one of those communities that is often neglected or excluded from representation on stage. And I felt like this was too important of a story to tell specifically the good and the bad. It isn't just a trauma story. There is good in it. 
Alpha Edens, is a Chinese language teacher who has landed the lead role of Moi. Her Chinese name is Singing. The producers of the play were adamant about casting Chinese actors. I first read the script of uh, Alpha Moi, I felt so connected. For example, uh, let's take the name. Alpha just means a flower. Moi means a uh, girl. So Alpha Moi uh, means a uh, little girl. Because back then in uh, 1800s, right, Chinese women didn't have their own official first name. They had a nickname that was called by family members. Veronica Smith, the assistant director of Chinese Lady, goes on to share some of the many things she learned from working with Chinese actors. It's not called foot binding in Chinese culture. It's called lotus because it's made to be beautiful and to think of the lotus flower as opposed to the way that we are taught it, that it's this very barbaric, old school form of binding feet, but it was a form of beauty and culture. Smith elaborates on her cultural and historical reflections. And Alpha was like, let's talk about the opium wars and let's talk about everything in China and let's talk about just how important that point is. And we were like, we are sold. (laughs) Say no more. Because as Americans, even if we have learned culture, unless we have lived there or experienced directly, we're really very sort of ignorant to what the true meaning of that culture is. Smith reflects on why this play and its cultural history is important to share with Oklahomans. History is not always pretty. I don't think there's a need to put this positive spin on it and make it pretty. History is history, and we need to learn it accurately. Chinese Lady is a story of tolerance versus acceptance. Her story highlights heavy themes such as racism, sexism, and economic exploitation. But it also tells the story of many Americans' willingness to embrace newness and differences with empathy and cultural awareness. Oklahomans have a very unique opportunity to witness Chinese performers coming to the stage to share their artistic talents, individuality, and commitment to authentic storytelling. For tickets, go to their website, info at okworldstage.org. For Focus, Black Oklahoma, I'm Anthony Cherry in Tulsa. Focus Black Oklahoma is produced in partnership with KOSU Radio, Tulsa Artist Fellowship, and Tri-City Collective. Additional support is provided by the George Kaiser Family Foundation and the Commemoration Fund. Our theme music is by Moffat Music. Focus Black Oklahoma's executive producers are Koresh Ali Lansana and Bracken Klar. Our associate producers are Smriti Iyengar and Jesse Ulrich. You can visit us online at kosu.org or tricitycollective.com slash Focus Black Oklahoma and on YouTube at Tri-City Collective. You can follow us on Instagram and Twitter at Focus Black OK. You can hear Focus Black Oklahoma on demand for free at kosu.org, NPR One, NPR.org, or wherever you get your podcasts. The KOSU Daily Podcast provides you with local news to get you on your way every Monday through Friday morning. The KOSU Daily includes stories from our state impact reporters looking into topics including health care and education. We'll also have reports on Indigenous affairs in the state of Oklahoma, along with rural and agricultural issues. You can find the KOSU Daily wherever you get your podcasts or at KOSU.org. The KOSU Daily, Oklahoma News, every weekday.